With passive transport, the key here is no energy, but it requires this thing called a concentration gradient. That's what that symbol means there. The brackets read concentration, and then the GRAD in the middle is just the abbreviation for gradient. Now, passive transport means that there's actually no assistance. And so a molecule that follows a passive transport mechanism goes directly through the membrane. It doesn't have to go through a protein or a, a, a channel or anything like that. Directly through that, but it by the So directly through the membrane, when it goes directly through the membrane, we call it diffusion. So all molecules, all matter, has this inherent characteristic where it just moves at random. Um, if you want to know what that is, it's called Brownian motion. We named after Robert Brown, who was the first to characterize this idea. So even in these tables, which you think of as being pretty inanimate, pretty solid, the molecules are actually moving. Now, they're not moving very fast. They're moving at really, really slow. That's why they're actually solid rather than liquid or gas. But they still are moving. And it's just an inherent characteristic of all matter is that it just moves. As these molecules move around, every once in a while, they bump into the membrane, and they cross the membrane. They go through the membrane from one side of the membrane to the other. So let's say from outside the cell into the cell. And that's just simple diffusion directly through the membrane. So I'm used to this random movement of matter. Now, in the case of water, if we've ever viewed water crossing from one point to another, say across the membrane, we call that osmosis. So the term osmosis is actually a term that describes diffusion, but it's specifically for water. So we're reserving the term osmosis for diffusion of water. OK, so this is directly through the membrane, simple diffusion. Now, occasionally, we're going to also involve some sort of mechanism that's planted inside of the membrane. This is a protein. Um, so it's going to be made up of amino acids. These are what confer all physiological function. Right? So if I have a protein that can help or facilitate the movement of a molecule through the membrane, so we're not going directly through the membrane, now we're going actually through a channel that's called a core that's being placed inside the membrane through one of these proteins. That process is no longer simple diffusion, which is just directly through the membrane. It's going to be this idea of facilitated diffusion. Diffusion that occurs using a concentration gradient, but is helped along by going through a pore rather than directly through the membrane. So we go through this channel. That channel is what facilitates the process. So we call that facilitated transport. It's still passive, because what is passive? Anyone remember what passive actually describes? Passive with no need for energy. We're getting the impetus to move because we have this established concentration gradient across the membrane. We're going to facilitate the process now by having the protein present that allows that concentration gradient still to work in the same way, but it just makes it easier for the molecule to cross. This usually happens with molecules that are larger in size or that have an adverse chemical reaction with the hydrophobic nature, the, the uh, lipid nature of the membrane. Okay, just, you've all seen oil and water, right? You dump cooking oil in a pot of water, and what happens? It sits, on top. it sits on top. And why does it do that? Okay. It has very little to do with mass or density. It actually has to do everything with the chemistry between the two different molecules. 
lipids, they like to clump together in such a way that they cannot interact with the water. Water is this molecule, it's called polar. And when you look at a water molecule, hopefully you've all seen something similar to this before, that would be a chemical diagram of water. You have hydrogens that are on one side of the molecule and oxygen that's on the other. Oxygen is really good at pulling on electrons. What type of charge do electrons have? They're negative. So if the oxygen is really good at pulling on those electrons, where do the electrons hang out? Around the oxygen or around the hydrogen? Oxygen is really good at pulling on. So they hang on here towards the oxygen. And so that makes this side of the molecule negative. Over here on the hydrogen, the, the electrons really aren't hanging out there that frequently. So the hydrogen side of the molecule actually becomes more positive. This is the description of polarity, and you've probably all heard that before. And you've maybe heard it not necessarily in biology or chemistry, but in politics. Right now, the United States political spectrum is considered to be really polarized. You have very conservative, and you have very liberal, and there's not much moderate in between kind of politicians right now. Everybody's on the far end of the spectrum, uh, far end of either side of the spectrum. Or maybe you've heard it from the globe before. The planet Earth, the globe, has a North Pole and a South Pole, and they're different, and so it's polar. So this idea of polarity means that you have difference, differences that occur on either side of some object, whether it's a political spectrum, the globe, or a ball. It's the polarity that defines what will dissolve well in something. So water is considered the universal solvent, but it really only dissolves polar molecules really, really well. Salt is a polar molecule. You dump NaCl, table salt, inside of water and it dissolves. Right? It disappears. And it's because of the polarity of the salt. Lipids, on the other hand, are not polar. The electrons get distributed equally across the whole molecule. And so since they don't exhibit any polarity, they have a tendency to stay away from the other polar molecule of water, and they form that layer. Well, the same thing happens here in the membrane, right? You get this layer that forms, and in fact, it's called a bilayer, where you have water on one side of the, of the, of the membrane and water on the other side of the membrane. In the middle, you have this barrier that is non-polar. Let's say I have a molecule here now that's polar. And I've already told you that lights dissolve lights, right? So if it's a polar molecule, how well can it be to the nonpolar membrane? Not well at all. What if it's a polar molecule or a nonpolar molecule? It just slips right through. Nonpolar molecules are going to preferentially use this passive transport because they don't need any assistance to move through the membrane. Testosterone is a lipid. It's produced by, from cholesterol. Cholesterol is another lipid, right? Testosterone sits right through the membrane. It doesn't even need a chance to float right through. Water does cross through the membrane directly. And it crosses at a tune of about 100,000 molecules in a second. Like, wow, that's a ton, right? Well, check this out. If I pop a protein in there, to facilitate the movement of water, which there are several proteins that do this. They're all called aquaporins. Basically, literally means water pore. That aquaporin, when it's in the membrane, and it's open to allow water to cross the membrane, it's not 100,000 molecules in a second. It's a trillion molecules in a second. So just by adding that protein, we can facilitate the movement of the polar molecules through the membrane really, really efficiently. So again, facilitated because the process is aided or facilitated by the presence of that protein channel. So that protein channel aids or facilitates the transport of a given molecule.
Now, there's really two types of proteins. There are proteins that are always open, so it would be like not having a door here. Get rid of the door, and I just have the cams. And we can move in and out without doing any, putting in any sort of energy or changing the shape of the open. It's across right through. But there are some proteins that are also going to be facilitated uh, uh, diffusion molecules. Passive transport doesn't require energy because I'm getting it from the concentration gradient. But when the molecule that needs to cross the membrane interacts, they change the shape somehow of that protein to open it up. So it goes through this, that, that particular protein goes through this process of opening and closing to allow molecules to cross. So you can imagine that if I had a great reduction in the concentration of that molecule, it's going to reduce the frequency of operation of that, uh, of that uh, protein to allow that molecule to cross. Because remember, this particular membrane, incorporating all of those proteins, by definition, is selectively permeable. So now we're beginning to see that, that biological function come out in the function of these single proteins. If there's not a lot of molecules that need to cross through that transport mechanism, it just remains closed. And then as you increase the number of molecules that are present, they start to open up and they start to facilitate the movement, select for the movement of that particular molecule. So those three things are passive transport. Passive because there's no energy. We can also use energy. And so this type of transport we call active transport. Active because you need energy in order for the molecule to cross. Now, biologists, and I've said this before, are extremely lazy people. The chemist would want you to draw the complete chemical structure of ATP. The biologist just simply says ATP looks like this. And we put a little lightning bolt around it. The lightning bolt represents that it's energy. ATP is actually the molecule that's going to be used in order to facilitate the energy that's required or to get the energy that's required for this system to work. Okay? So that's what's happening right here. We're using ATP, our energy currency in the cell, to give that energy to this protein so that energy or that protein can actually be facilitated to move. Does that make sense? So just like if I go over here to the door, I have to use my muscles to turn the knob and to open it up. ATP is going to be used here to facilitate the process of opening this channel. So what if I have no ATP? I can't open that channel, right? There's no ATP and it's needed to open the channel it's not going to open up. So it requires energy. ATP is an absolute necessity for this particular protein to open up. Now, you've all seen a pump before. You've gone to the gas station, you've used the pump, you've looked inside your car, the pump's in there. If you've been up to the top of uh, the hill here, you see a pump there, water pump that used to be water up in the, in the tower there. Why do we use pumps? So why, why do you need to use gas pump? Because you're taking the gasoline from a big tank inside of the ground against gravity up to your pump, right? So we use pumps to move things from here on our pump the planet from low areas on the ground to higher places on the ground. Right? If I want to move water up the hill, I can have all of you pick up a bucket and begin to carry the water up the hill and dump it up there and then it begins to flow down. And I've created a pump, sort of, where I could actually go and get a real pump, turn that bad boy on, and we'll move water against gravity. Now what do I need in that pump to move water from? Let's say down here, the entrance to campus up to the top of the building cross. We need some sort of energy source, right? Most of the time it's gas or gas to a two cylinder or a two stroke engine and crank that bad boy up and <coughs> up the water goes, okay? So 
according to that uh, that idea, we call all of these active transport mechanisms pumps. But we're not pumping against a, const uh, yeah, a gravitational gradient or a gravitational force here. We're pumping against a concentration gradient. So we're actually going to see that we're going to take a large, or I'm, I'm sorry, we're going to take a small amount of molecules and move them to where there's a larger amount of molecules. Lower concentration, a higher concentration. And this is the opposite that we saw with past, because we're actually now going against that force that's produced by the concentration gradient. Make sense? So we're going to pump the molecules. Now there's one molecule, uh, one protein pump in particular that I'm going to highlight real quick just because it's so critically important. So most of you probably know that you need to consume about 2,000 calories a day to diet, right? In order to stay alive. Half of those, half of the calories that you consume uh, in a 24 hour period go to operate an active transport pump. There's a pump that's called a sodium potassium pump. So about a thousand calories to operate the trillions and trillions of sodium potassium pumps that we find in all of the different cells and tissues in the body. We're actually going to talk in a few different systems about functions of the sodium potassium pump, so we're going to come back to this. But basically the way the sodium potassium pump works. So if this is my membrane and this is my pump, sodium ends up being really, really high concentration on the outside of the cell and really low concentration. That's why my is so much smaller. Really low concentration on the inside of the cell. Potassium is going to be the opposite. Potassium, really high here and really low here. Now both sodium and potassium sort of leak. They're like, they, they kind of are like leak fossils. But I need to maintain these concentrations for uh, the normal physiological function of a bunch of different cell types and tissues. So what I'm saying is that sodium begins to sort of trickle through down its concentration rate through a passive transport mechanism. But I don't want it to trickle through like that. I actually want the sodium to be back out here. So as that sodium trickles in, the potassium trickles out, what happens is the sodium potassium pump takes that sodium that's leaking in and it pumps it back out, burning an ATP molecule. Right? ATP is my energy currency. So I'm undoing that leakiness, so to speak. I'm countering the leakiness. And I'm going to be able to maintain this high concentration inside, low concentration outside of sodium in the opposite of potassium, despite that leakiness. Okay? About 50% of your caloric intake, 1,000 calories, used to produce the ATP to help this system function. When we come back to this, it'll primarily be in places like the nervous system, uh, in muscle system, in uh, skeletal muscle, and then also in uh, cardiac tissue in, in the heart. This right here is a difference in charged particles across the membrane. And in your mind, what you should really be thinking right now is battery. And what I mean by that is if you look at a battery, if you're to, to dissect a battery, put, I'll put it right here next to this. You all know that in a battery, that's a great battery, you have a positive side and you have a negative side, right? But what you may not know is right there in the middle, you have a membrane. And in that membrane, you have a bunch of negatively charged molecules and you have a bunch of positively charged molecules. And really what it is is it's a molecule that gives up electrons really easily on the negative side and a molecule that accepts electrons on the positive side. And maybe you've heard of a lithium chloride battery before. Lithium gives up electrons really well, chloride picks up electrons really well. Okay? So if I take some sort of wire or something and I can get around that membrane and let's put a little light bulb in there. So here's my little light bulb. I can begin to move electrons around that membrane and as I move those electrons around that membrane, what happens to the light bulb? It's not that hard. It, it turns on. It lights up, right? And it's actually doing work. Right now these lights on, that's a form of work, right? Producing the light that's being generated. Why do we use the battery? 
because we want the light to turn on or we want our little kids' toys to be able to run around the house, right? So we want those little toys and lights and flashlights that we want them to be able to do work. And they always need a charged battery, a battery that has a difference in charge. That difference in charge is measured by electromagnetism in terms of voltage. Battery is a 1.5 volt cylinder. Over here in the uh, cell, we can actually measure the voltage as well. It's right around minus 70 millivolts, meaning there is more negative here, less positive out, or more positive out here. And so if I make a pathway around or through the membrane, I can actually begin to do work as well. And we'll begin to see how that work actually begins to be processed. But I always want to keep my batteries charged, right? What's the worst thing to have happen at 3 o'clock in the morning when you're out camping and you're a bear? To have that battery not operate the flashlight, not be able to, not be able to work. You always want to have charged batteries, right? If you're in the cell, if we don't charge our battery, what do you think happens? What happens to the flashlight? You say the flashlight goes dead. What happens to the cell? The cell dies. So you've got to maintain that, that concentration gradient between the sodium and the potassium. And so as sodium leaks in, as we decharge the battery, we recharge it. So it takes energy. So those different mechanisms there are for single molecules. But what if I need to move a large amount of molecules? We can also do that. And it's called bulk transport. So companies like UPS and FedEx and DHL are all really good at bulk transport, right? You probably all recently bought something, maybe it was your textbook, and you can track where your textbook is coming from. Now, is it a single book that's being transported by one person from Cambridge, Massachusetts to you here in Cleveland, Georgia? No, they take from regions around the United States, large numbers of packages bolt them together and move them all at one time. So bulk transport is this idea that we're going to move large amounts of material from one location to another. And this location that you need to really be thinking about is across the membrane, right? So there's that very scientific word again, lots of stuff at once. And we can really do this in three different ways. You can think of the three ways in which we can do this. We can move a bunch of stuff out of the cell, or we can move a bunch of stuff going into the cell, or we can move a bunch of stuff across the cell, from one side to the other, or from one location to another in the cell. So lots of stuff. And just like with those companies that move a whole bunch of stuff all at one time, they package everything up. They don't just throw your books in the back of the trailer and hope for the best. They package it up. So we have to make little packages to do this large amount of stuff. And the way we do this is we actually wrap it up in a membrane. So it's another lipid bilayer that's going to have a bunch of stuff packed away in. You can see a couple of examples here. So this is moving stuff into the cell. The technical term for moving stuff into the cell is endocytosis. Now, the um, sort of stupid person in me to remember this kind of stuff, ENDO kind of reminds me of ink too. So there's a little mnemonic for you. Hopefully that will help. So into the cell is endocytosis. Cy, cyto, C-Y-T-O. I knew we, we talked about that um, a couple of weeks ago. I didn't remember what that is. I think I can see that. Yeah, it's always referring to cell. So this literally means into the cell, <laughs> if you're a Now, 
there are actually three different ways in which things can be moved into the cell. This first way is if you have a big particle, so a giant molecule, let's say, of some sort of food particle for a bacteria. You can reach out with your membrane. These things called pseudopods, which means they, feed, they reach out and they grab onto whatever it is that they're going to pull in, and they sort of envelop it in the membrane. And then they begin to bring it in, and it sort of pinches off that piece of membrane that is wrapped around that big food particle, and you get this packet filled up with that substance. In Latin, the term that we use for eat or to consume is phago. It's spelled with a ph. So this is phagocytosis. Solid or eating, cell eating is what this would be translated as. The second type here is not for solid, big solid particles, but is actually to bring in a solution. So maybe we need a large salty solution, such as a bunch of sodium all at one time, and we don't want to move it across just a single pathway. We want to just grab a whole bunch of sodium. Sodium dissolves well in water because sodium is polar water, and polar salt dissolves in there. And so the cell also can kind of, this is called indigenation, it can kind of bring in its membrane, and as it brings it in, you can imagine that that solution is just going to flow in there, kind of be sucked in, and then it gets wrapped up into another pack. And you end up with another mess and all another pack of this solution. And so that's kind of like drinking. And the Latin for drinking is pina. So that second type is pinocytosis. Now the third type is a little bit, a little bit different. When we need something very, very specific inside of the cell. So let's say I need a bunch of glucose inside of the cell. Then what the cell can do is it can produce these little proteins that are called receptors. Whenever you hear the term receptor in biology, think about something that can reach out and grab onto something. So you might have a receptor that can bind glucose and grab onto the glucose that holds on. So if I need a bunch of glucose or whatever the molecule is, I can produce these receptors that can grab onto that molecule that I want. They get stuck up into the membrane, and then they begin to grab onto those materials. And once I have enough of those receptors loaded up with that material that I want, we begin to go through that invagination process again. This time, you get a little bit of that solution, but most of it is you're holding onto that molecule that you want with that receptor. So this one, we don't have a lot here. It's a lot easier to remember because it's in English. It is receptor-mediated endocytosis. So receptor-mediated endocytosis. Just simply referring to the receptor being produced so they can grab on the molecule that's needed and then that gets brought to the cell. So those are the three types of endocytosis, phago, pino, and receptor mediated, to bring stuff into the cell. Two other options here, though. We can send stuff out. Um, insulin's produced in the pancreas. It's produced specifically in a cell called the, the um, beta cell. But insulin acts every place else. It doesn't really act too much in the pancreas. It acts a little bit in the pancreas, but it acts on tissues like skeletal muscle, liver, and adipose tissue. It's quite preferential. So when it's produced in the pancreas, I want to get rid of it. And when it's produced, it's producing large quantities, so I want to ship it all out in bulk. So to get rid of a material, or to move a material out of a cell, such as insulin, I'm just going to send it out, and that's called exocytosis. Another little assistance here. Exo kind of reminds me of exit. So exit the cell. Exocytosis is this idea that we move a bunch of material all one time out of the cell. Now, there's not any specific, you know, phagoexocytosis or penoexocytosis. It's all just called exocytosis. We don't really have these variations. And it basically looks something like that. If you're to observe a cell, you might see a vesicle, this lipid bilayer with a bunch of stuff in it. It moves up to the membrane, and as it 
moves up there to the membrane and goes through this process called docking, which just simply means that that, that membrane is making contact with the, uh, the, the external membrane, the, the cell membrane. And then it begins to open up this little pore. And that little pore opens up. And really what happens with the vesicle is that that, that lipid bilayer gets incorporated into the lipid bilayer of the cell. And as it gets incorporated in there, it opens up. Everything else just releases out into the surrounding exercise of tissue, or exercise of the fluid The last option is just simply called transcytosis, and this is to move around the cell. To move from one location to another. So these vesicles that get brought in through endocytosis or exocytosis, or get brought out through exocytosis, um, they may be needed in one location or are produced in one location and then be, need to be moved out to the membrane so that they can go through endocytosis or exocytosis. So when I produce that insulin, it gets put together in the Golgi complex inside of the cell. The Golgi complex is pretty deep inside of the cell. That vessel that gets released from the external face of the Golgi complex and it gets moved out through transcytosis to the cell membrane to undergo exocytosis. There's two last things that I want to do, sort of in this first introductory material from chapter one through four. Um, I want to talk just briefly about energy production. And hopefully you've been exposed in a previous science class, biology or chemistry or whatever class you're taking, to energy production inside of a cell. The food that you consume has energy sources in it, things like glucose, simple sugar. Um, or fats or other proteins, all can be used to help regulate the energy or can be used as energy inside the cell. But there's a problem. Those molecules can't be directly used. It's kind of like uh, going over to Europe. What do you need to buy goods in Europe? You need a euro, right? You can't use a US dollar over or not supposed to. It's actually illegal. So if I show up and say, yeah, I'd really like to buy this t-shirt that says I'm a loser in Germany, and I hand them a couple bucks, I'm probably not going to be able to buy that, right? What do I need to do? I need to exchange my currency. So glucose is the foreign currency. Facts are a foreign currency, and they need to be exchanged into a molecule called ATP, ATP which is adenosine triphosphate. And you can just refer to it as ATP. Uh, if I can give you the simplest one or two sentence definition or, or description of chemistry, chemistry is all about reorganizing chemical bonds. And when I say reorganizing the chemical bond, I really mean you're redistributing electrons from one location in a substance to another location in the new substance that you're producing. Whenever you reorganize electrons, really what you're doing is you're changing the energy of those electrons. So I can take a molecule of glucose, which is nothing more than an organization of electrons. Those electrons are associated with atoms of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. If I have electrons associated with the carbon, and I move those electrons to be associated with oxygen in a new molecule, I change the energy state of those electrons. I actually make those electrons higher energy. Okay? It would be just like saying if I take a ball from the bottom of the hill and I move it to the top of the hill, I change its energy, right? At the bottom of the hill, it's got much lower potential energy than it does at the top. Or a rock. If I drop a rock from the first window out there, I'm going to make a little crack in the Okay, what if I drop it from the top of the building or go to the helicopter? It's going to create a bigger divot in the ground because there's more energy. So if I can reorganize electrons 
so that they're in a higher energy state, that's, that's going to be a, a beneficial thing for them. So think about it this way. Glucose is a certain organization of electrons. And as I move those electrons through these different chemical reactions all the way down until I can produce ATP, I'm slowly making different energy that can be utilized by the cell. It's just like taking that ball and moving it to the top of the hill. This is a very low energy state because the electrons are all associated in low energy positions. And as I move through over to the end of this whole pathway here, which this whole thing is called cellular respiration, I eventually begin to generate adenosine triphosphate. That ATP now has the same electrons that were originally in the glucose organized in a completely different way. And there's a much higher level organization. If you look at the ATP molecule, adenosine, that's, if you know any DNA, that's the A in DNA, right? Adenine is, is one of the uh, nucleotides in DNA. I take adenosine and I add on three phosphorus molecules. That's my triphosphate. That very outer bond between the second and the third phosphorus molecules, that bond that's created, if I can get electrons into that bond to create that bond, they are really high energy. Glucose doesn't have its high of energy. And so there's a difference between the glucose and the ATP and the amount of energy that's going to be present there. I can make high energy ATP bonds that then can be utilized all over biology to help other chemical reactions to occur, to help protein synthesis to happen, to facilitate uh, things like active transport all over the cell we're going to be using ATP. So I want to take and I want to produce ATP molecules from as many molecules that I'm consuming in my diet as I can. The whole process here, from glucose to the production of ATP, is called cellular respiration. Cellular respiration is just a series of chemical reactions to reorganize the, the uh, electrons in the glucose to electrons stored in it, ATP molecules. So from glucose to ATP. And that's my exchange. That's my, my currency exchange process. For you and the US dollar, you go up to the, uh, to the currency exchange, exchange office. Most of them are in the airport or someplace close, right? And you say, hey, can I exchange these $100, $100 bills for years? And they give you the exchange, and now you have the currency that you actually can use in the environment that you're in. Glucose, can't use it directly, that's the dollar. ATP is our euro. We'll come back and we'll talk more about energy production, but I just want to kind of give you this idea of ATP is what's needed, and we get it preferentially and primarily from glucose. And that glucose is in everything that you eat, from the Snickers candy bar to the apple. Glucose is in both. So we've talked a little bit about cells, we've seen some of the anatomy of cells, we've discussed some of the cellular processes. What happens when I start to take individual cells and put them together? I begin to build this uh, thing called a tissue. And if I take different types of tissue and I begin to put them with other types of tissue, then I begin to produce this thing called an organ. Okay? So if you look at the pancreas, the pancreas is an organ, but it's made up of two different types of tissue. One of those tissue is uh, called the islets of Langerhans, or the pancreatic islets, and it's made up of a bunch of different types of cells. So you kind of see this hierarchy that's beginning to come out. Different types of cells organized together is called a tissue. Different types of tissue organized together is called an organ. Different types of organs organized together is called an organ system. I take different types of organ systems and put them together, I get the organism. That's all the level here. We're all organisms. How many organ systems do we have? Does anyone know? There are 11. The rest of this class is really going to look at these 11 organ systems. 
how did it develop, how did they function, how can we keep them coming? So it would be really good if we sort of start out with a picture of those 11 organ systems, what are they, and then we'll begin to work our way through each. So again, this hierarchy, we just discussed in some detail cells. Now I begin to take different types of cells, put them together, what do we call that? Tissue. Take my different tissues, put them together, I now have a organ to the organ system, which is primarily we're going to spend most of our time dealing with these organ systems. And then lastly, we have the whole organism. Now there's other levels of biology as well above and below this little pathway here. You take multiple organisms and put them together, you get population, all that kind of stuff all the way through interactions with the environment and call that the ecosystem. And then on the lower end here, cells, what makes up cells? We looked at them individually. The organelles. You have mitochondria, you have the cell membrane, the cytoskeleton, and then even below that, then you have molecules. All of those organelles are made up of molecules. Below that, you have the atoms, and then below that, you have the subatomic particles. And so biology is organized in this massive hierarchy from the very small subatomic particle all the way over past ecosystems to this thing called the biosphere. We're going to just look at this one small little section of that hierarchy in this class because we're dealing specifically really with humans, right? So we're, going to, we're going to stick with the human organ uh, organism dealing with the cells, tissues, organs, and organ systems. So you can see all of them listed out here. I want to just give you a primer. Put them in your notes so you can start thinking about them now. There's a total of 11 organ systems. And hopefully we can correct um, potentially some misnomers that you might have. Uh, we're going we're gonna to start with the skeletal system which deals with your bones and your joints and ligaments. We'll discuss muscle. And primarily when we discuss muscle, we really look at skeletal muscle. But the true organ system called the muscle system includes both skeletal, or includes the skeletal muscle, the smooth muscle that's incorporated into a variety of other organs and organ systems, and also the cardiac muscle that makes up the heart. But primarily, we'll look at skeletal muscle function. And we'll actually talk about how do we actually make a muscle contract? Endocrine, which is our system of hormones that help regulate function. The lymphatic system. How many of you have ever heard of the lymphatic system? Okay. A lot of you have probably heard of the immune system before as well. And people would say, oh yeah, the immune system is an organ system. It's not. It's actually a part of the lymphatic system. So the true organ system is the lymphatic system and kind of fit in there as a subgroup of the lymphatic system is this thing called the immune system. The digestive system, how we process nutrients. So we take, hopefully you have thought about this before, but maybe you have it. You consume something, whether it's a carrot or a hamburger, you're consuming it in other organism cells. And the digestive system helps to break those cells down so that they can so that the organism can process individual molecules that are important and can be used uh, in other processes in the body. The urinary system, which is obviously how urine is made, pee. But the urinary system is actually the way that we balance the chemicals in the bloodstream. We actually are making urine. Urine is, is a byproduct of blood. It's the waste product from, from, our, from our blood. The respiratory system or respiratory system. The respiratory system is uh, how we move one of the most critical nutrients in the body, which is oxygen. And when we look at respiration, most of you probably just think of 
when they air in and out of the lungs, and that's only one part of the whole process. There's actually four steps that we're going to learn. This is called external respiration, internal respiration, is moving that oxygen into the blood, and then we have uh, uh, respiration, I'm sorry, ventilation, external respiration, internal respiration is moving uh, the, the gases into the tissue and out of the tissue, and then cellular respiration is how we generate our ATP. Circulatory, that's how we move blood around the organism and it includes both, both the uh, cardiac portion and the hematological portion, the cardiovascular portion, which is the, the part of the vein and then in the vessels, and then the hematological portion, which is the blood. The integumentary system. Probably the least talked about physiological system on the planet right now is the most noticeable because this is what you're seeing here. Your nails as well. Uh, the nervous system, which is a electrical coordinator of physiological activity. And so we'll talk about function of neurons and how we move uh, signals from, let's say I get put my hand on a hot burner. Why do I pull my hand away so quickly? I don't even really have to think about it. It's all responsibility of the nervous system. And then the last here is the reproductive system. Now, some people would argue that because of the reproductive system, we actually have 12 systems because we have the you know, male reproductive system and the female reproductive system. Uh, I classically argue that we have 11 and we have a variation between male and female. So really, when you look at the reproductive system uh, of males and females, they're really not that much different. Uh, they are basically doing the same thing, producing sex gametes made through female sperm and males, uh, and it's trying to optimize the probability of conception. So we do have that male and female version or variation on reproduction. So those are 11 different organ systems. Can anyone tell me why we need our organ systems? What is the purpose of an organ system? And it really comes down to one term. It's a one word answer, maybe a two word answer. What's that? Okay. Really, we're maintaining that function, but we're maintaining the function in such a way that we maintain that function within livable limits. Look at body temperature. What's normal body temperature? Right around 99 degrees Fahrenheit. But you really fluctuate between 99 uh, or around 99 degrees. You get a little bit higher, what do we call it? We call it fever. We get below that, we call it hypothermia. So we want to make sure that we stay within that, within that range of livable body temperatures. Blood pressure, normal blood pressure is 110 over 70. If you go above that, we call it hypertension, and it's problematic. If you go below that, it's called hypotension, and that's problematic as well. So this idea that the organ systems help us maintain this livable balance, that those livable balances are, are referred to by the term oh, uh, homeostasis. So those numbers that I just gave you are actually the homeostatic set points. That is the livable, the, the average livable balance, 99 degrees Fahrenheit. But it's really around that that we fluctuate all day long. If you trace out body temperature, human body temperature through a 24-hour period, what you find is body temperature looks like that. And then the average right through that line there is going to be 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And then there's a range from the top of the peaks to the bottom of the peaks that are considered livable. You go above that livable balance, what do you think is going to happen? You get a fever and you feel terrible, right? The physiological system is beginning actually to not function as well as it should. And you go below that and you get really cold and shimmer a lot. Trying to bring the temperature back up, there's a lot of resistance. You just don't feel it it's because you're outside of those normal livable balances. So our 11 organ systems are all focused on maintaining homeostasis. 
for our livable balances. <coughs> The big example I gave was body temperature and blood pressure. But we could look at chemical levels of chemicals in your blood, little sodium levels inside of the bloodstream uh, or in the extracellular fluid. All right, that's all I got for you today. I will see you on Wednesday.